beginning of barley harvest. Amen. This is God's word. And so, people of God, with God's help this morning, we begin a new book. We begin a new expositional study of and meditation on the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth was not written by Ruth. God's word doesn't tell us who the human author is. Perhaps Samuel is the human author of this book, but we can't say for sure. But what we, what we do know is that Ruth is the word of God. This book is given to us by the Holy Spirit. We know who the divine author of this book is. As Peter says in 2 Peter 1, verse 21, that the holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The book of Ruth is God's word, infallible, inspired, perfect, without any errors. And the book of Ruth proclaims to us the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the theme of this entire book is the redeeming love of God the redeeming love of God. This book cries out for a redeemer. This is what Ruth is looking for, right? This is what Naomi is looking for, a kinsman redeemer. This book is about the redemption that God has wrought through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, children, who was Ruth? Well, Ruth was a foreigner. She was from the country of Moab. She was not part of God's people. She was a foreigner, an outsider, but the Lord showed her mercy. Ruth cast herself at the mercies of Jehovah. Ruth took refuge under his wings, and the Lord mercifully saved Ruth and adopted her into his family, and Ruth, the Moabitess, was included in the lineage into the physical lineage, the genealogy of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this book is, the whole book is about the redemption and the love of God. His, remember that word, chesed, his covenant-keeping love that God shows us in and through the greater Boaz, the Lord Jesus Christ the only redeemer of God's elect. And so this morning, as we come to chapter one of Ruth, this chapter is about returning home to the Lord. This chapter is about returning home to the Lord with true faith and repentance unto life. Notice how the chapter begins. How does verse one begin? Verse one begins with a family leaving Bethlehem, right? They're leaving the covenant community. And where are they going? They're going to a foreign land. They're going to Moab. How does the chap chapter end? The chapter ends, the last verse, with that family. Many of them had died. Now it's just uh, Naomi and his daughter-in-law, Ruth. But now they are what? Returning to Bethlehem. So ch verse 1 is departure from Bethlehem, departure from the covenant community, but the chapter ends with return to the Lord and return to God's people. Look at verse 22, verse 22 with me. So Naomi what? Returned. Do you see that? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which, what? Returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Isn't that interesting? The chapter begins with leaving Bethlehem. The chapter ends with returning to Bethlehem. By the way, this is the same city which would be called the city of David. And out of this city, in the fullness of the time, God would send the Messiah who would be born in the little town of Bethlehem of a virgin, God in the flesh. And so here, Naomi and return home to the Lord, and they are saved through Jesus Christ. And so as we meditate on chapter 1, God calls you this morning to return to him, return to the Lord, and be wholeheartedly committed and devoted to him. Listen to uh, Isaiah 55. This is Jehovah speaking. Isaiah 55. Seek ye the Lord while he may be what? 
found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. We have forgiveness of our sins in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Redeemer of God's elect. So the theme of our sermon this morning is this. God calls you. Not a suggestion, it's a command. The Lord calls you to repent of your sins and return to Him by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the point of this chapter. The Lord calls you to repent of your sins and return to the Lord by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we consider that main theme of returning home to the Lord with repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, we'll meditate on this chapter under three headings. Three headings. Number one, leaving the covenant community. Secondly, trials in a foreign land. And then thirdly, returning home to the Lord. So firstly, then, our first heading, leaving the covenant community. This is what happens, right? Look at verse 1 again. The v- verse 1 gives us the context where this, the events in this book took place. Now it came to pass in the days when who? The judges ruled. You see that? This is during the time of the book of Judges. In the days when the judges ruled, that there was a what? A famine in the land. We'll come to that in just a moment. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. And he and his wife and his two sons. What's going on here? You remember the time of the judges. The judges were the rulers that God raised to deliver the people. But during the time of the judges, it was a time of moral and spiritual decline, right? It was a time of idolatry. It was a time of wickedness. And the people of Israel were not faithful to the Lord. And they were living in rebellion against the Lord. And so what happened? A famine. This famine is a sign of God's judgment upon the nation because of the nation's sin and rebellion. By the way, the only path to blessing for any nation is obedience to Jehovah. That's the only path to blessing for any nation. Every nation must turn to the Lord. If the nation does not turn to the Lord, the nation will be under judgment, right? God's people were under judgment. So what happens in the land of Israel? There's a famine. There's a famine. And in that context, we meet meet this family, the certain man from Bethlehem whose name, verse 2 tells us, is Elimelech. What does he do? He takes his wife, his two sons, Malon and Kilion, his wife, Naomi, and how do they respond to the famine in the land? They respond by leaving the covenant community, right? They respond by departing, by leaving Bethlehem. Now think with me, children. Is that the proper response? Is that the proper response to judgment? When God sends judgment, should we run away or should we turn to the Lord in repentance? Repentance is the answer. Instead of running away from the covenant community, this family and the rest of the people of Israel should have humbled themselves. They should have sought the Lord with repentance. They should have run to the Lord for refuge instead of running away from the Lord, right? You know this familiar verse from 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their, what? Land. I will hear, I will heal their land. So when things got difficult, this family from Bethlehem left the covenant community. And where did they go, children? They went to a pagan nation, and they settled down with the heathen. The pagan nation is Moab. Now, here's the irony. 
It was rebellion and lack of devotion to Jehovah that caused the famine in the first place. Therefore, leaving is not the solution. Repentance is the solution. Turning to the Lord is the answer, not running away. Now, of course, God is sovereign even over the sins of his people, and the Lord uses all things for his glory. We know that the Lord is going to use the departure of Elimelech and his family to bring a foreigner, Ruth, into saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is going to use this situation to save Ruth and adopt her into his family. And so even this situation will put on display the mercy of God in and through Jesus Christ shown towards sinners. Amen? But Elimelech, as the husband and as the father, is responsible for his actions. What was he doing by removing, removing his family from Bethlehem? What was he doing? He was cutting his family off from the means of grace. He was removing his family from the church. He took his family to a place where there is idolatry and other wicked pagan practices. Now, children, the name Elimelech is a beautiful name. It, may, it means... My God is king. Eli, my God. Melech is king. My God is king. That's a beautiful name to have. But was Elimelech living consistently with his name? It's not enough to give mere lip service to God, right? It's not enough to say, Jesus is Lord just with your lips. You must be devoted to the Lord. You must submit to him. You must live for his glory. Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Right? Why do you call me Lord? Lord, twice, emphasis. You're my Lord, Jesus, and yet you're not interested in obeying me. See the problem? Now, what about you? What about you? What are your priorities? What do you value? When you have trials in your life, like a famine, death of a loved one, physical ailments or diseases, suffering of diverse manners, when you have trials in your life, how do you respond? Does suffering make you more committed to the church? Or does suffering make you run away from the church? How, how many people in our world who claim to be Christians prioritize finding a faithful Bible-believing church in their decision-making? Think about that. Would you move to a different place just because there's a better job opportunity? What if there is no Reformed church in that area? Does that affect your decision? Or is your decision made solely on the basis of better salary, a better job opportunity? What about your children? What about your family members? What about the means of grace and the spiritual care for your family? Does that matter to you? The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek ye, not second, not third, seek ye what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. There is a priority. Priority is to be given to the kingdom of God, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the preaching of the word, to Sabbath observance, to Christian fellowship. There is a priority Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then whatever you need. Dads, I know you men want to care for your family, provide for them. The Lord will provide. You moms, you want to care for your little ones, and you want to be faithful. The Lord will provide what you need. You single people, you need grace to live in holiness. And some of you are waiting for a spouse. The Lord will provide. Be patient. As you wait, what do you do? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, unbelievers are characterized by the love of the world, right? So unbelievers are focused about what? What would give me more money, better job opportunities, influence, priority, and, uh, you know, the, the sphere of the world and so on. Unbelievers are characterized by their pursuit of the pleasures of the world. But Christians need to have their highest priority as the pursuit of God's glorious kingdom and, listen, obedience to his will. To obey is better than what? Sacrifice. Obedience matters to God, right? Is your life characterized by obedience to the word of God? We are called to obey God, not just in good circumstances, but in all circumstances, including when there's a famine in the land. We obey God. He is faithful to provide for us. You hear me? We are called to obey God the Lord. Listen to 1 John 2 verses 15 and 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. And the lust thereof but he that, what, doeth the will of God abideth forever. The world is passing away, but if you do the will of God, you will abide forever. That's what 1 John 2 says. And so an application for you dads and moms, there's something more important for your children than mere comfort or financial prosperity or material security. It's commitment and devotion to God and to his word. It is better, it would have been better for Elimelech. Now we know that as Elimelech left Bethlehem, God used that situation, situation to save Ruth. Praise be to God. But it's better to stay with God's people in the time of famine than to go to a foreign land with abundance, but no preaching of the word. Did you hear me? The Lord will provide for your children. The Lord will provide for your family. The Lord will provide for you. You trust him. Don't run away from the Lord. Trust him. Obedience at times can hurt. Obedience to God's word at times is costly. But it's worth it. Because Jehovah is God and there's no one else and he will take care of his people. If the Lord takes care of a sparrow and knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, would he not care for you? If the Lord knows about the flowers of the field that are here today and gone tomorrow, do you not think that he has you in your mind whom he has adopted into his family through the Lord Jesus Christ? Will he not care for you as your loving father? Trust him. And so let me address every one of you. Whether you are married, whether you are single, whether you are a child or an, or an adult, every one of you is called to single-mindedness. Single-mindedness and wholehearted devotion and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of you, this is your calling. Whatever situation you find yourself in, be singularly focused wholeheartedly devoting to the Lord, devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls you to submit to his lordship, to serve him with sincerity. Jesus Christ is not interested in part-time Christians. Do you hear me? He's not interested in mere lip service. All of you belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you come to church, let me make a few more applications. When you come to church, when you gather for public worship as the church, is it a chore that you got to do uh, in order to check it off a list of duties? Or is it a delight for you to be in the Lord's house with the Lord's people? Do you delight in the Sabbath because it is the marketplace for the soul? Or is it a burden that you just got to do? 
like going shopping, you got to do it once a month or once a week, got to go to church, or do you delight in the Lord's day? Is Sabbath worship a joyful duty that you delight to do, or is it a drudgery that you can't wait to get over with and move on to something else that is more enjoyable to you? I'm sure that you were offended by the mockery of Christianity that took place at the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics, and rightfully so. But are you also concerned about the desecration of the Lord's Day during the Paris Olympic Olympic events? Are you also filled with sorrow when America has a worship service called Super Bowl on the Lord's Day? Or do you participate in it? How can we expect our nation to honor the Lord's Day when Christians don't honor and sanctify the Lord's Day? So many Christians see no problem with stopping by Starbucks to get coffee on your way to church or go to a restaurant after church. What about the evening service? Is that important? One of the signs of the moral decline of a nation is church houses closed on Lord's Day evenings and parking lots empty. That's a sign that the nation is under judgment because the church is in a compromising situation. Do you delight in the Lord's Day? We need to examine ourselves. Are we playing games with God? Also, you might say, well, I do come to church. I'm I'm present physically. You may be present physically. Are you also present with your hearts? Are your hearts here? It's possible for your bodies to be here and your mind to be elsewhere. Parents, and this is convicting to me as a dad, as a father, your view of the church will influence and impact your children's view of the church. Did you hear me? And it's not only what you say to your children. It's how you live. It's how you live. Your view of the church will influence your children's view of the church. So don't take your family away from the means of grace like Elimelech did, but encourage them to attend diligently to the preaching of the word. Psalm 82 says this, I love it. My soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My flesh and my, uh, my heart crieth out for the living God. Listen, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand elsewhere, right? A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. And then the psalmist says, I had rather, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I would much rather be a doorkeeper in the church any day than to live and hang out in the tents of wickedness. Is that the cry of your heart? Do you long for the courts of the Lord or you can't wait for the church service to be over because you got something better you got to do? Can you say with the psalmist, I was glad, not compelled, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so Elimelech takes his family away from Bethlehem into Moab, settles down with the heathen. And then we see, secondly, our second heading, trials in a foreign land. Trials in a foreign land. So we see in verses 3 through 5 what happens. Naomi's husband dies in Moab. Elimelech dies. And then later, her two sons also die. So here is Naomi left alone. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have sons to take care of her. She's all alone, and she's now left with two daughters-in-law who are also widows, Ruth and Orpah, trials in a foreign land. Naomi was in a desperate situation, right? 
From a human perspective, Naomi was in a helpless situation, but dear congregation, God is the help of the helpless. God cares for his people. Did you know God cares for widows and orphans? Did you know that God cares for those who are rejected by the world? Do you know that God cares for you even in your pain and suffering and others may not know what you're going through? God does. God does. He knows you better than you know yourselves. And he cares for his people. God cared for Naomi. Naomi was not forgotten by the Lord. The Lord is going to provide for her. The Lord is going to use these difficult circumstances to bring her back home to God's people so that not only is Naomi provided for physically, but she's also cared for spiritually, right? The Lord is compassionate. The Lord is merciful. His mercies are great. We saw last Lord's Day as we finished 2 Samuel. What does David say in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 14? I'm in a great strait, meaning a great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord. Why? For his mercies are great. But let me not fall into the hand of a man. David said, you know what? If I have to fall into the hands of the Lord or into the hands of wicked men, let me fall into the hand of the Lord. I know him. I trust him. Even when he sends suffering and trials my way, it is for my good and for his glory. I know the Lord. His mercies are great. Great is his faithfulness. So Christian, when you go through trials, especially in hard times, Instead of running away from the Lord or feeling bitter, cast yourselves at the mercies of Jehovah. Cast yourselves at the covenant-keeping love and mercy of our God. You see, Christian life in this world is marked by suffering, right? You know that. You and I suffer in this life. And some of us have more sufferings than others or d various kinds of sufferings, but we go through trials. We go through sufferings in this life. But do you know what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18? For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time, the momentary sufferings, will give way to everlasting pleasures. You wait on the Lord. You trust him during hard times. You cling to the Lord and rest in his love. 2 Corinthians 1 tells us that, the, that one of the titles of God is what? He's the God and Father of, of mercies and the God of all comfort. Don't you love that name? He's the God of all comfort. I need comfort again and again. God is the God of all comfort. And then 2 Corinthians 1 says, He comforts us in all our tribulations so that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And our sufferings and trials are used by God, our merciful Father, to draw us closer to Him. Is that not true? Is that your testimony? That you've gone through some really difficult times, and as you come out of those difficult times, you're closer to the Lord than you were before? That you can look back at those trials and say, man, that was really painful. That was really difficult. But the Lord brought me closer to him. I realize how much I need the Lord. And so the Apostle Paul says, these things come our way so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. And so don't lose heart, Christian. Don't lose heart. Cast your burdens and anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. Jesus says in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. John 16, in the world ye shall have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. 
Dear people of God, in your trials, make sure that you are prioritizing your commitment to the Lord and your communion with him and with his people. Amen? Especially when you suffer, it's important that you don't run away and hide in a corner, but by the grace of God, even with tears coming out of your eyes at times, you fellowship with other Christians. You come to church. You sit under the preaching of the word. And if when you sing, your voice cracks because you're so overwhelmed with sorrow, so be it. The Lord is honored when you obey him even in your pain. Don't lose heart. Sit under the preaching of the word. Spend time with God's people. Pray, and the Lord will care for you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. You see, the Lord is going to care for Naomi, right? Isn't that wonderful? He's going to bring her home. The Lord is not going to leave that widow in a foreign land. He's going to bring her home to the people of God. But before the Lord does that, you know what else the Lord does to Naomi? The Lord is going to provide for her a faithful companion, her daughter-in-law, Ruth. The Lord is going to save Ruth, and Ruth will be a comfort to Naomi. And this brings us to our final heading then, returning home to the Lord. You see, Naomi doesn't return home to the Lord alone, does, does she? No, she actually comes home to the Lord with Ruth. She's not alone. She has a daughter-in-law who is a Christian now, who is saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. So the Lord is with Naomi, and the Lord has also provided for Naomi a faithful friend. Do you see that? Value Christian friendships. Value friends that God has put in your life, like in your church, who love the Lord Jesus Christ, because those friends will bring you comfort in your trials and encourage you to persevere and not lose heart, right? Returning home to the Lord, our final heading then. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. You see that verb, that she might return from the country of Moab? That verb, return, appears again and again in this chapter. This is why this is the theme of this chapter, returning home to the Lord. And at the, that verb is at the heart of the Hebrew word for repentance. Repentance. In our repentance, we're turning away from our sins, but we are turning to who? To the Lord. And here Naomi now wants to return to the Lord she is responding with genuine repentance, and she's not going to be alone, but Ruth will also respond with repentance, and she will return home to the Lord with her mother-in-law, Naomi. So we see this little dialogue between Naomi and her daughters-in-law in verses 7 through 14, right? Uh, Naomi tells her daughters-in-law daughters to actually return. Where? To Moab, right? The same word, return. Naomi says... I'm an old woman. I don't have any more sons to give you as husbands. And even if I were to be married tonight, and then by the time my sons are old, are you going to wait for them to be married? You got nothing with me. Why don't you return to your gods? Return to Moab. Now, perhaps this was a test. This was a test to see how Orpah and Ruth would respond. Are they going to be faithful to Naomi and to Naomi's God? Or are they going to go back to their false gods and to their pagan nation? This was a test. Listen, children, I want you to pay attention. Orpah and Ruth were given two options by Naomi. Two options. Return to Moab, which has everything that you need, but you'll have to reject Jehovah, okay? Go back to Moab, you'll have bread, you'll have all that you need, and in abundance, but in so doing, you will have to turn your back against the Lord and reject the living and the true God. That's the first option. Or here's the second option. Embrace Jehovah by faith and be connected to his people 
and you may not have anything else. Either have all the comforts of Moab, but no gospel, or be committed to the living and the true God, and you may lose everything else. Which option do you want? Well, Orpah makes her decision. In verse 14, Orpah kisses her mother-in-law, and then she decides to return to her false gods. She decides to go back to the abundance and the prosperity of Moab, the temporary prosperity of Moab, and reject the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Orpah leaves Naomi. But then Ruth also makes her decision, right? And what, what is Ruth's decision? Look at the end of verse 14. But Ruth clave unto Noe, Naomi. Do you see that? The, that Ruth clinged or clave unto her, unto her mother-in-law. This is covenantal language. This is covenantal language that shows commitment and loyalty to the triune God. The reason Ruth was committed to Naomi, her mother-in-law, is because Ruth turned to the Lord and Ruth trusted in Christ alone for her salvation. Listen to the Ruth's confession of faith, verses 16 and 17. Look at it with me. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to, here's our word again, return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And here's the key. Here's the key why Ruth is so committed to Naomi and to the people of Israel. Thy God, Ruth, is my God. Jehovah is not just the God of my mother-in-law. He is my God. Ruth was converted to true religion. Ruth became a Christian. Ruth trusted in Christ alone for her salvation. And God changed her. God regenerated her and gave her faith and as a result, Ruth affirms her commitment and her loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ and to Naomi because Naomi is one of the members of God's covenant community. Isn't that interesting? If you love the Lord Jesus, you will also have a love for the people of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? They go kind of hand in hand. Here is Ruth saying, I love the Lord. But as a result, I love you, Naomi, my mother-in-law. And I know that Moab might give me another husband. Moab might give me bread. And if I go back with you to Bethlehem, I may not have anything else. But you know what? I have found something greater and better than all the riches of Moab. I have found the Lord because the Lord has found me. And I love the Lord. And therefore, I love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the confession of a Christian. I have made my decision. All the pleasures and treasures of this world I count as dung. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. David says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. What is that one thing? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And so here's Ruth saying, I will cling to the God of Israel because he is the only true and living God. All the gods of Moab are false gods and idols, but Naomi, your God is God, and he is my God. I will follow the Lord. No turning back. This is a picture of true repentance. This is a picture of repentance unto life. Now think about this also, children. Ruth was a pagan. She was an outsider. She was not a citizen of Israel. And yet, Jesus said, those who come to me, I will in no wise, what? Cast out. 
If you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what your background is or how many sins you've committed or how, how many idols you've worshipped. If you repent of your idolatry, turn from your wicked ways and come to the Lord, he will abundantly pardon you. This is what the Lord does to Ruth. Ruth, a foreigner, became a daughter of God by adoption through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, children, adults, are you persuaded, like Ruth, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory and that he is the pearl of great price? Are you prepared to say, I will follow Jesus no matter the cost because his love is better than wine? Christ calls you to follow him with single-mindedness, laying aside all hypocrisy and serving him with sincerity. Be steadfastly minded to follow Jesus Christ and depend on him and trust in him to live the Christian life. Well then, verses 19 through 22, as the chapter ends, what do we see? Naomi returns home to the Lord. He re uh, she returns to Bethlehem. She's not alone, but Ruth is with her. Ruth is now a Christian, a sinner saved by grace in Christ. But notice verse 20. I want you to look at verse 20 with me. Notice Naomi's attitude in verse 20. And she said unto them, to the people... Call me not Naomi. The name Naomi means pleasant. Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. And the name Mara means bitter. Bitter. Call me Mara, for the, the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. It's true that Naomi suffered a lot. Right? It's true that she went through a lot. She, she lost her husband. She lost her sons. She went through a lot of suffering. That is true. But here, Naomi is exaggerating her misery. She's exaggerating her pain. She's saying, the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. That's true partly, but the Lord also dealt kindly with her. Did he not? But Naomi's like, don't call me Naomi anymore. Just call me Mara because I'm this, I, I've been dealt with in bitterness. She was focusing so much on her suffering that what happened? She forgot to give thanks to the Lord for his mercies. Can you relate to Naomi? I can. I struggle like that. When we go through suffering, how easy it is for us to focus on our suffering and our trials, and we get so caught up with that that we forget, oh, wait, I need to count my blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to give thanks even in my suffering. Yes, my suffering is real, but I don't need to exaggerate it. The Lord is merciful to me. Is that not true? In your worst day, Christian, you're not going to hell. How can you complain? Of course, we suffer, and it's good for us to cry out to the Lord to, for help. All of that is good. But let's not get so focused on our suffering and our trials that we forget to give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18 says, Listen, in everything, what? give thanks. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks to the Lord. Let's make sure that we're growing in gratitude. Let's make sure that we obey God out of a heart filled with gratitude, even with tears. Our sufferings are real. Our trials are real. But you know what else is real? Through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. We have been spared the lake of fire. God has saved us. That is also real. That is also true. So let us rejoice in the mercies of God even as we long for God's deliverance. Let us give thanks to the Lord. 
and growing gratitude. So let me end by applying the theme of this chapter. What's the theme, children? Returning home to the Lord. Let me just very briefly apply that theme to three specific categories or three specific groups of people. Number one, individuals need to return to the Lord. Secondly, churches need to return to the Lord. And thirdly, listen, nations need to turn to the Lord. And so firstly then, individuals need to return to the Lord. So children, ladies, men, you need to confess with Ruth that Jehovah is my God, the triune God, one God in three persons, and I will worship him and I will serve him. You need to say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. You as individuals, whether you are little ones, all newborn children, or whether you are in your 80s or older, every individual here needs the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to turn to the Lord. Did you hear me? Make that your priority. Don't think tonight when I go to bed, I'll think about turning to the Lord. There may not be a tonight for you. Turn to the Lord now with devotion and loyalty and with Ruth say, the Lord is my God. I will follow him. Jesus brings us to God. We need to turn to the Lord. The rest of your life, Christians, follow Jesus with loyalty. Depend on his grace to live your Christian life. Young people, don't waste your life. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Secondly, churches need to turn to the Lord. You know, we live in a time in human history where there is an abundance of Bibles, correct? Not just in America. In India, you could go to Amazon India, you can click a button, you can have the Bible shipped to your door. We live in a time in the world where we have Bibles on our phones that we can access and we can read. You can go to a Dollar Tree, for example, and you can buy a King James Bible for less than $2. Or you can have on your phone whatever Bible version you're using, and you can scroll and read. You could even do audio Bible. Think about the access we have to the Word of God today, correct? But watch this. Even though there are so many Bibles around us, there is a famine of the Word of God in churches. Charles Spurgeon said, there is dust enough on some of your Bibles to write the word damnation with your fingers. Are your Bibles collecting dust or are you reading the Word of God? What about your churches? Are churches in America preaching and teaching the Word of God or the Bible is like this museum piece that is put on display but never touched, never opened, never read, never preached, and never obeyed? Churches need to return to the Lord. Do you long to hear the Word of God every Lord's Day? Or do you want your ears to be tickled by the eloquence and wisdom of men? Do you long for exposition of the Word of God? Or do you enjoy self-help type messages that exalt man and there's no power? Churches need to return to the Word of God. When we turn to the Word of God, we turn to the Lord, right? Because it's the Word that shows us God and has the power to bring sanctification and transformation. And so pray that every Protestant evangelical church in America would return to the Lord and return to his word. We need reformation in our churches, reformation of preaching. We need to return to the purity of worship regulated by the word of God. Listen, how can we expect our beloved nation to change when churches are in a compromising position? Think about that. You might wonder, what's wrong with our nation? It's really messed up. But do we ever think, what about the churches in our nation? 
if the churches are messed up, how can we expect the nation to be any better? The problem is not with the White House. The problem is with the church houses in America. We need, as churches, to return to the Lord. We need to not compromise the gospel, but be committed to the pure preaching of the word of God. You see, Naomi came out of Moab with Ruth, and she returned home to the Lord, right? God's word calls you to practice biblical separation. Yes, biblical separation. Listen to 2 Corinthians 6. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty." You see, here's what I'm saying. We as Christians must live in the world, right? But we can't let the world live in us. Let us not fellowship with those who have compromised the gospel, who have abandoned the gospel of Jesus Christ, but let us join with and fellowship with those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and love his word. It begins with our local church. Let us be united as a church and pursue the unity in the spirit. And let us also rejoice in other like-minded, faithful churches around the world and in our nation. Let us pray. And then finally, and I'll end with this, nations need to turn to the Lord, right? Nations need to turn to the Lord. Nations are not indifferent. Nations are not neutral. And that includes the president of the United States. He's not a neutral party. He can say, well, I respect your Jesus, but I, I, I don't need to kiss him, uh, submit to him, acknowledge him as Lord. That can't happen. You know why? Because Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 30, he that is not with me is what? Against me. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So it's Christ or chaos, right? That applies to our nation. That applies to all nations. In Psalm 2, Jehovah commands the rulers, the judges, the presidents, the monarchs of the world to kiss the Son and submit to Him and acknowledge Him publicly and nationally as the Lord of lords and the King of kings. You know, we're in the election season right now, right? And in this election season... We listen to these politicians, and what do we hear most of the time? The politicians of whatever party is talking about, let's create more jobs, let's exalt our nation, let's have a better economy, let's bring down the inflation. But how often do we hear politicians speak about righteousness, about godliness, about honoring the Lord Jesus Christ, about sanctifying the Lord's day as holy, about upholding the moral law of God. How often do we hear politicians speak about the main problem of our nation, which is not bad, bad economy, but idolatry? Idolatry. Pray for your officials. Pray for your magistrates. Pray that God would raise righteous magistrates, righteous Christian rulers who would recognize that as a nation, we need to honor the God of the heavens and we need to honor his word. Do you know what will make our nation great? Listen, the book of Proverbs, righteousness exalts a nation. Did you hear me? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It's righteousness that exalts a nation. Our nation needs to turn to the Lord. You need to pray for that. Pray and persevere in prayer 
We need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ as individuals, as churches, and even as nations. The book of Ruth shows our need for a kinsman redeemer. And the only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God became man, and so was and continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Come to him. Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins and turn to the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and look to him. Amen.